Good evening and welcome to the fourth of our Influences on Parliament uh, and in this instance we're going to talk about political parties and other political influences and I just want to say one or two things before we start. The first is if you are following the AQA series of exams then political parties and other political influences are not one of their main areas that they question on. AQA generally tend to ask questions about the big three, the Law Commission, media and pressure groups. That doesn't stop you when they ask open questions discussing political parties, but if I'm being honest my advice to you is to make sure that you understand the Law Commission, media and pressure groups by far and away more completely than you understand political parties. The second thing to discuss is that it's not there's not very much to talk about when we talk about political parties as an influence on Parliament. So it sort of tends to feel like you're just padding out your answer. And for those reasons, this is not my favourite area for students to spend a great deal of time studying. That being said, it is quite important that you understand why it is that parties and particularly, as we'll look at in a moment, the government over here, play such a big influence in terms of the way that Parliament does business. And you'll see here that the greatest political influence are going to be the political parties. And we've got a, a range of political logos, party logos here, to demonstrate that idea. So let me just start by looking at a little bit of background. And I'm hoping, and I'm going to take it as read, that you all know the process of the way in which our governance works. And you will all know that every five years that there is a, a, an election, um, an election to see who will become the next government. During that time, each political party will publish what is known as a manifesto. And a manifesto is a list of all of the reforms that that party wants to undertake if they were to become the government, the main strongest party. So this sets out quite clearly what influence each political party is going to have on Parliament if it becomes the government. Now the largest party at an election becomes the government and it has up to five years to enact its manifesto. So it's got five years to make sure that the things in its manifesto come to fruition. And it's true to say that most reforms that are put before Parliament will become an act. And the reason for that is that because the government is the largest party then pretty much what they get to say becomes the law. So they get a chance to say what becomes law and what doesn't become law. So to that extent you can see precisely why a political party's manifesto and particularly the government's manifesto carries a huge amount of influence in terms of what laws are passed and what laws are not passed. And there's no better way of looking at that than looking at these two areas together. Now, the state opening of Parliament happens every year. And in the state opening of Parliament, which is a huge ceremony, it's televised, and I advise strongly people to watch the next state opening, the Queen will read a speech that's written by the PM. So the Queen's speech is written by the Prime Minister at the state opening of Parliament. And in that, she says very clearly, my government will. Now, constitutionally, that phrase is quite important. But what she's technically saying is saying that in the coming year, my government will do these things. And these things will be the things that they have outlined in their manifesto. So you can start to see just how powerful and how much influence the ruling party in, in, in Parliament has. So that's the first of our major influences and it will be useful if you've got time to take a look at 
what the current government is planning to introduce within the next year because that will demonstrate the sort of political influence that it will be exerting on Parliament. There are another couple of ideas that we do need to discuss in terms of the way that politics has an influence on Parliament. And the first is that political influences will be as a response to certain events. And some bills are responses to particular and unexpected events. Now we can look at here at perhaps um, the Prevention of Terrorism Act. So this first one, this will be the Prevention of Terrorism Act and that's 1974. And that was in response to the Birmingham IRA bombings. This is Birmingham. I'm old enough, unfortunately, to remember these. But this is the Birmingham IRA bombing in which the Irish Republican Army bombed a number of pubs in Birmingham on the mainland. And, that, and the response to that by the government was that they created the Prevention of Terrorism Act 1974. Similarly so, the Drought Act of 1976 was a response to the incredibly hot summer. I mean the hottest summer this country's ever known and you've probably still heard you know your parents or other people bumping their gums about how dreadful it was in 1976. It sounds to me as it'd be fantastic a whole summer of the most hot scorching weather ever but nevertheless there was a water shortage and Parliament introduced the Drought Act to cope with that water shortage. In more recent times, the Dangerous Dogs Act, 1991, Dangerous Dogs Act, 1991, was a response to um, some dreadful attacks by some quite um, difficult and, and, and frequently nasty breeds of dog on on especially young children. So the government decided that it would enact the Dangerous Dogs Act almost immediately. And finally the um, anti-terrorism, let me write this is quite a long one, the Anti-Terrorism Crime and Security Act 2001 was as a direct response to the um, events of September the 11th to 9-11-2001. So you can see that Parliament um, or that government, um, political, the political party that makes government, has a huge influence on Parliament when it responds to events that are either unexpected um, or uh, unfrequently emergency events. The next area is just to think about and discuss Europe. As we are members of the EU, the EU then becomes another political influence. Remember under the European Communities Act nineteen seventy two the um, the UK is obliged to follow European Community law. In particular, Parliament may be required to pass legislation in order to implement a European directive. So Europe itself is a political influence on our own Parliament. Our own Parliament may have to pass laws to allow European law to come into force with us. A good example of this is the Consumer Protection Act. And that was in 1987. And this was passed to give effect to the Product Liability Directive. So this was a European piece of legislation and our Parliament had to pass this, so the UK Parliament had to pass this in order to enact the European, the piece of European legislation. And that imposes strict liability on producers for damage caused by their products. So you can see that Europe is the first of the external influences, political influences um, on Parliament. And the, the, the next area is that individual MPs can frequently cause some pressure or exert some pressure and some influence on Parliament to 
change the law. And in this case, I'm going to focus on one example. I'm going to focus on George Young MP. And um, this is all linked to a young lady called Susie Lamplew. Not directly, but Susie Lamplew um, was abducted and went missing um, in, in the early 90s. And the family of Susie Lamplew set up the Susie Lamplew Trust. And in um, January 1998, George Young responded to an event set up by the Susie Lamplew Trust and pushed and pushed and pushed to get private hire, so taxes, um, licensed. And the aim of that was to make sure, because there was, an, oh, there was a, a great deal of, um, a number of sexual crimes were committed by unlicensed um, private hire taxi drivers who would uh, pick particularly women up um, and because they weren't regulated, nobody knew who they were. Pretty much they could put a sign in the front of their car and pretend to be a taxi. And what George Young did is George Young, working through the Susie Lamplew Trust, exerted a huge amount of influence on Parliament to get the private hire bill passed, which meant that all um, London cabs had to be licensed before they could engage in the carriage of passengers. So you can see how individual MPs, when they are hell-bent enough to do something and they have a, a really good campaign and cause behind them that they can exert a fair amount of influence on Parliament itself, particularly because they're already in the heart of Parliament. So lastly, let's just take a look then at the advantages and disadvantages of um, political influence. And I've got these here, they're ridiculous acronyms because they don't really um, they don't really say a great deal, do they? That could be, I don't know. I, I don't know how you're going to remember those. I've just used some, um, I've just created an acronym for each. And the first advantage is that political parties can respond very clearly to public requirements. And this is the, um, in case you weren't aware, this is done blame to the shooting. The public requirement was to have some action taken about the use of handguns following the tragic shooting in Dunblane. And the, the, the Parliament was very quick to be able to respond to the public requirement on handguns because it was already in power. The second advantage, of course, is that there is a rapid response to emergencies. Now, this is 9-11, but it does mean that there's because Parliament and government and political parties are at the heart of the decision-making process that when something like 9-11 happens they can respond incredibly quickly and if you consider the discussions that we've had on pressure groups pressure groups can take a long time to build up a head of steam to get change well because we are talking about our lawmakers here they can do it almost immediately the third area, and the third area of an advantage, is that the ideas for legislation are developed consistently. So, testing the water, if you like. Parliament, governments, political parties will try ideas out whilst they're in power or whilst they're in opposition, and that will give them ideas for future legislation. And the final advantage is the flexibility to respond to other political influences. Here, of course, I've got the um, abolition of the death penalty. Which allowed... Um, which, which allowed Parliament to pass laws um, getting rid of the, the, the death penalty. Let's have a look at the, the disadvantages, because to, to be honest, when the, 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 there is one of them is a double-edged sword. The first disadvantage is that, if we are honest, frequently political parties use their influence in order to curry favour with the electorate. They do what they think the electorate wants them to do, rather than what's in the best interests of the country. And they do so because politics is about power, and power is about getting elected. So the easiest way to get elected is to do things that are popular. And frequently, the influence that parties exert can be for their benefit, not necessarily for the benefit of the, of, of the population as a whole.
The second disadvantage is that the government usually gets its way. Now this can be an advantage and a disadvantage, which is why I've put these two here. And because the government is the strongest party, it means that whatever it wants generally tends to get enacted. Now that can be very positive in terms of democracy. Most people have voted for the government and therefore most people will want to be represented by the government. So it's right and proper that they should get their way. Unfortunately, sometimes, particularly when linked with this, if the government wants to do something that is popular in order to maintain its power, it can frequently do that. Another disadvantage is that frequently flawed laws can result. That's hard to say, actually. Flawed laws can result. And remember we spoke about the Dangerous Dogs Act, the 1991 Act. This was rushed through. It was really poorly put together. And the problem is, is that nobody actually thought about what sort of dogs or what would happen to dogs. I mean, there were just far too many problems. So allowing political parties to push through legislation, particularly if it's done as a knee-jerk reaction, particularly if it's done to court popularity, can frequently result in flawed law. And finally, you, you often hear political parties say, if we get into power, we will reverse the decisions that the last government made. There's a good example of this at the moment, and I try to keep these um, so as I don't have to update them all the time, but it seems to be um, sensible to bring this up. The current government are operating what has become popularly known as the bedroom tax the tax on um, people who have more than one spare room in their house. And what the current Labour Party have done is they've said that if they get into power, they might possibly repeal the bedroom tax. So if Labour gets into power, they might possibly repeal. Now, of course, to repeal an act that is already in place and already bringing in money is very, very expensive. So this idea that I have political influence, I'll change the law. When your political opponent becomes in power, they might want to change that law. And to do so might cost a great deal of money. And that's pretty much it. You can see there's not a lot to say. You can see that, in fairness, the uh, main political influence is by the party that forms the government. And I'll have to say Europe in, exerts a fair amount of influence on our party, on our parliamentary system. So go back to what I said at the very, very beginning. Concentrate on the Law Commission, on the media and on pressure groups. But make sure that you understand the impact that government, especially, but political parties do have on that process.